And uh, so I use uh, and have used for years as, as to kind of a outline the five A's of soul winning. And one of the best books that is ever written on visitation and soul winning, in my opinion, was, uh, was uh, by George Godfrey on how to win souls and influence people for heaven. I've read uh, all of Brother Howe's books, and I've read uh, all of Brother Fist's books, and uh, I've read uh, C.S. Lovett, and I've uh, read uh, Sumner Wimp's book on uh, God's Practical Pastoring, and man, tremendous stuff, and, and different, different about different soul winners, and that sort of thing. But, but this is just an easy, teachable format to me, and the five A's of soul winning. Uh, the first A is approach. If that's spelled wrong, you correct me, all right? And uh, then uh, the uh, next one is the appeal. Uh, I'm sorry, not the appeal, the atonement. I, well, I just got through teaching you how to make an appeal to a crowd. And so. And uh, then the approach, the atonement, the appeal. And uh, then assurance. And then agreement. Okay. So the five A's. Approach, atonement, appeal, assurance, and agreement. Under the ideal of the approach, we're talking about how do you approach someone about their soul. Whenever I first got saved, I remember my pastor preached a message on being a soul winner. Heard someone w once make a, a statement in, in college chapel service one day, no, in, in a church education class one day, inspiration without instruction leads to frustration. Inspiration, or challenge if you want to please, inspiration without instruction leads to frustration. If you inspire your people to do something, you don't teach them how to do it, you will frustrate them. And so you can challenge your people to be soul winners, but you do, if you do not help them to understand how to win souls, you will frustrate them. But my pastor preached on being a soul winner. And I believe God wanted, wanted Christians to be... I mean, I, you know, I've just been saved a little while. Matter of fact, it was the night I was getting baptized that he preached on being a soul winner. And, and I was delighted to find out that anybody could win souls. I'd already been out on visitation with one of the men in the church and watched him lead a soul to Christ. And man, I, I thought that was marvelous. I didn't know but anybody but preachers could do that kind of stuff. Later on, the Lord did call me to preach. But, but at the outset, and boy, and I went to the altar and I wept and cried and said, Oh, God, make me a soul winner. And two days later in my living room, I led my first two souls to Christ. There was two girls that was dating, one of them was dating my roommate, and one was a friend to her. Whenever I got saved, you agree or disagree, doesn't make any difference, I'm just telling you what happened. But whenever I first got saved, got into church, I knew the fellow that was uh, sharing an apartment with me wasn't saved, and I wanted to see him get saved, and I figured it'd come closer to, to, to uh, him getting saved by me going ahead and letting him stay there, and me begin to follow the Lord and let him see what God could do. And, uh, and so that was... Why he was still there, and I came in one night on Monday night, me and some of the men of the church been out uh, doing some exercising, lifting weights, I'm sure you can tell. And, uh, and, uh, and so we'd, we'd, I got in about 8.30 that night, and boy, they were sitting in there, and my buddy was, uh, uh, he'd been smoking dope, and they were all as high as a kite. And I walked in, and my friends from the church went, just like that. And, and so this gal, that, uh, and, and this fellow, my roommate and his girlfriend went to his room, and this gal sitting on the couch, and, or laying on the couch, she was about wiped out. And so I sat down and witnessed to her, told her all that I knew about the Lord for about two hours, which was just a repetition of the same thing. So that's all I knew. Listen, I didn't even know where John 3.16 in the Bible was. But I knew I wanted to be a soul winner. By the way, you'll never train your people to win souls until it's first here in their heart. That's why what Brother... Jasper shared with us about how to, how to have a sweetheart list, as Brother Boyd calls it. It's so important. They get a burden here. They'll learn how to win souls. Whether you teach them or not, they'll find somebody that will teach them how to win souls. But you'll never get them to winning souls until first it's right here. 
till first they have that burden, that desire. They catch that somehow. And so I had that desire. And so, and so I told this girl how the Lord had helped me to quit smoking and how God was working in my life and all this kind of stuff. And she said, and I said, are you saved? She said, yeah, I, I'm saved. Well, to whittle the story down, I got up the night. I went to bed that night because I could tell she wasn't making any, you know, wasn't getting anything. It's about eleven o'clock. I went to bed. Got up the next morning. And I was working an evening shift that starting that, uh, oh, I think that following Wednesday at the job where I worked. I got up the next morning and uh, and they were still there. Nancy was in Skip's room and the, and that gal Betty was uh, was still on the couch. And I came out and I woke them up. Said, "Don't you girls have a job? Aren't you going to work?" I said, "Oh, my stars! What time is it?" And I said, "Well, it's." Nine o'clock, and they said, oh, we're already late for work. And I said, well, why don't you call your boss and tell them you're not coming in, I'll fix your breakfast. I wanted to win some souls. And they said, okay. And I fixed breakfast, and while I was sitting there, Betty, who was now sober, had been wiped out the night before, said, you just tell me about how you got saved and you quit smoking and all this stuff. said, can you tell me some more about that? Boy, and I did. And I just witnessed for all I was worth. The tears started trickling down. I said, I, and finally I said, Betty, you told me last night you were saved. You ain't saved, are you? She said, no. Started crying. I looked over at Nancy. I said, Nancy, I've been watching you for two weeks. And I can tell by looking in your eyes you're not saved. And boy, she said, oh. <laughs> Now, listen, that's just nothing but pure zeal. But God blesses a desire. Amen. He really does. And you know what? There's some people sitting in your church that has that same type of desire. And to cut the story down, I finally got a hold of a, of a fella at work, and he said, he said, well, read them about the crucifixion of Christ, Matthew 27. And I read them about what Jesus had done for them. I said, now, y'all go get on your knees somewhere and get saved. Ask the Lord to save you. They did. Skip came home from work that night, and they were still there. He said, and here's the amazing thing. As soon as they came back out of the bedrooms where they'd gone to pray, they came back, and they said, we got to go. And I said, what do you got to go for? And they said, we got to go home and put on some clothes. You know, they had the midriff things and stuff. Isn't that amazing what God can do? And then, the, and then the, uh, uh, that afternoon they came back and Skip came in from work. He said, what are you all doing here? And Nancy ran up, put her arms around his neck and said, I got saved today. And he went, hey, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That night after the girls left, well, and, and, the, and the pastor had come by and talked to him, explained baptism, tried to witness to Skip, and, and he had kind of made light of it. Well, after they left, I was getting ready to go to bed. He said, hey, wait a minute for... Before you go to bed, tell me what you told them. Boy, and I flipped over Matthew 27 and read about what Jesus did for him, how he died for him. And I said, let's kneel down here and pray for these girls. They'll follow the Lord in baptism. We knelt down at the coffee table and I prayed and started to get up and walk off. And old Skip said, God, I said I saved. I ain't saved. I'm lost. Please forgive me and save me. Three souls of two days later, I fell into something I've never recovered from. So everything that I've learned, I've learned because I got the bug and didn't know nothing. So the approach, how do you approach someone? How do you really approach someone? How do you, how do you come up to them? Well, you need to understand that there's going to be three, day, uh, three basic types of visitation you're going to do. There's going to be cold turkey visitation where you just go out and knock on doors. You already know that. I mean, that's not new to you. Especially if you've been starting a church, you know that's what you've got to do. You can hang all the shingles up. You can put all the signs up. You can run the advertisement. And by the way, you need to do all that. But if you sit in your office and don't ever go out and knock on the door, forget it. They ain't going to come. And by the way, you don't get what you want. You get what you sow. You go and, and knock on doors, and God will send people in you've never talked to. Is that right, Brother Johnson? You remember, I spent two weeks with him last year, and, uh, and uh, uh, out just knocking doors, and one night a fellow showed up, and his own, that was our worst afternoon. I mean, everybody is unfriendly on the street, and all the dogs started trying to bite us, and the wind was blowing, making our heads hurt, and it was just a terrible afternoon. We were just, you know, just by the grace of God, we stayed out there, and a fellow that we left, uh, either gave the track to his mother, or, or just left it on the door, he came that, that Sunday night and said, I came because... You guys knocked on our on our door. Yeah, that's right. And I've had other people come to church that that nobody had uh, had talked to just because we went. I was in Silver City, New Mexico, one time, and me and the pastor had been out knocking doors, and a fellow walked in the middle of the service, Indian fellow, young man, 
Walked up and sat down. I preached that night, gave invitation. Boy, right down the aisle he came. It was almost invitation time when he got there. He got saved, and I asked him about what, how did you find out? He said, well, I, he said, I just had a fight with a friend of mine, left his apartment, walked out on the street, and I saw a flyer in the window about the revival all the way on the other side of town. He said, that's why I was late coming in. I had to walk to the service. I knew there's something going on over there that I needed. God does that sort of thing. If we'll be faithful to go, he'll send people in that we have not even made contact with. But cold turkey is one way of visitation. Then there's going to be the person that has visited. That's always your best prospect, the person who has shown enough interest to come in your church that you go back to and follow up on. That's the second type of visitation. Then there's a third type of visitation, and that's somebody's child. In other words, you've got some little child that comes to your Sunday school, parents don't come, you're crazy if you don't visit in their home. Absolutely crazy. If you've got a bus ministry, you don't try to win those moms and dads of the Lord, you're crazy. You're absolutely out of your mind. What are you spending the money for if you're not trying to reach the whole family? That's the idea behind it. Good night, I can take you to Benton, Arkansas and show you three families in the Victory Baptist Church today that are a direct result of the bus ministry. Direct result of it. It started out with the kids coming. And just like Brother Seidel talked about coming to the altar every service praying for mom and dad, and one day mom and dad came and got saved. Now then those kids are grown, married, have families, and all that clan is in church because of the bus ministry. It's profitable. And so you're going back either. You're either going to be out cold turkey door knocking or you're going to be visiting, following up on, on, the, on somebody's come to your services or you're visiting up on, on a family as a result of one of the children coming. So we're going to talk about going up to the door. What in the world do you do when you go to the door? Well, the first thing you've got to do is knock on it. That's, that's deep, isn't it? Number one. Knock. By the way, that's not much. Don't be afraid to knock. First year I was in the ministry, I worked as assistant pastor in our home church, Victor Baptist Church in Benton, Arkansas. By the end of ten months, there's calluses on those knuckles, knocking on doors. I'm serious. From knocking on doors. There's not hardly a street that I go down in Benton, Arkansas, I hadn't knocked on those doors. No, I'm, not, I'm just being honest. I went out, the preacher said, I'm hiring you to knock doors, and I went out and knocked doors six hours in the daytime, two hours every night. And so you knock on the door. Somebody comes to the door. Then you've got to, you know, got to kind of warm up to them and talk to them a little bit. Most of you fellas already know how to do that, but maybe some of you don't. It's very simple. Hello, I'm John Krausen from over at the uh, Bible Baptist Church. Just out doing some visiting today. I want to stop by and pray you a short, friendly visit if you have the time. Isn't that simple? Somebody says, well, how in the world do you get in? Well, if it's a lady comes to the door, you don't want in. You really don't. I'm serious, you don't. You don't want in. Be better for you to say, or if it's a child comes to the door, you don't want in. Excuse me, I'm not against winning kids of the Lord. I'm for winning kids of the Lord. But I'm going to tell you what, we live in a crazy world today. Right. We live with some mighty perverted people, and we better guard our testimony. It's important. Right. We come to the door. If there's somebody that you don't know, and you're just out knocking on doors, but let's say that it is a man like Brother Harvey comes to the door. How you doing? I'm John Krausen. I'm out visiting from Bible Baptist Church. Just want to stop by and pay you a short, friendly visit. Somebody says, how do you get in? There's four magic words. you got to get them. May I come that will work. Amen. Really well. I don't use it all the time because sometimes it's it's obvious. I mean, the guy comes over. Well, well, <laughs> he probably doesn't want me to come in. Okay, <laughs> but if he's pretty amiable and pretty friendly, I'd just like to visit with you for a little while. May I come in? And by the way, it is important whenever you're out just door knocking that you do try to get in and win somebody. The Lord, the persons you get in their home, way to lead them, the Lord, you have come a lot closer to getting them to your church than if you just witness to them at the door. You really will. Brother Grandy and I were out knocking doors last year down in Bakersfield. By the way, there's nothing wrong with this. You need to learn your area and learn what they will allow you to do. And as we were out going visiting the last year over in Bakersfield, he said, I found out that, that, uh, that people you know, are kind of standoffish. We knocked on the door of a, of a lady one afternoon. We talked to her. I asked her about her soul. 
I believe I did. And I asked her about her soul. And she said, well, no, I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven. I said, would you want to talk about it right now? She said, well, I really don't have the time. I said, would you mind if I, if a pastor here set up a time to come back and talk to you? No, I'd like for him to. Where's that lady at today? Got baptized last Sunday. Got baptized Amen. last Sunday. And she's going to church, and we're praying for her husband. His name's Paul Burns. Pray he'll be saved before we get there for the revival meeting or while we're there in the month of April. Paul Burns. Pray that he'll get saved. He needs the Lord as his Savior. But I'm saying that that so we're approaching somebody, we're trying to get to them, we're trying to reach them for Christ. And so it's just a simple thing to, to be friendly and to, and to be amiable with them. Now let me just uh, touch on this and then I'll get back into this in just a little bit. So winning works, but you've got to learn how to make it work. Not every area is the same. I don't care what anybody says, not every area is the same. Sinners are the same, sin is the same, Jesus is the same, salvation is the same, but not every area is the same. I went with a pastor friend of mine, Mark Patton, started a church over in Las Vegas, Nevada, back last year. We knocked on 70 doors in about an hour and a half. You know why? You're not getting in over there, so there ain't no sense you busting your britches trying. The church that he now has, it's going, and they're running in the 70s and 80s and been up over 100 on a, on a time or two and having folks consistently saved over there. Everybody he's gotten in, he did the same way Brother Grandy and I did. Knock on the door, tell them about the church, give them a personal invitation, and then just say, if, if you think you'd be interested in finding out more about the church, I'd be glad to come back at a time convenient for you. Well, yes, I believe I would. Well, when's a convenient time for you? How about Tuesday night? Everybody, almost without exception, everyone he's got into church is people that he's gone back, that he set up appointment just out knocking doors. Now, he has a goal of knocking on between five, and 700 doors a week. And he does it. That's work. It really is. That's work. But that's why in the course of a year he's, he's running in the 60s and 70s because he's worked. And, and there'll come a time whenever you won't be able to do that, Pastor, and you may be able to, and, and you'll have to miss some of that. And you'll just have to set up a time, two hours a week or four hours a week or whatever, but you just go out and do that sort of work. But in the initial stages of church planning, you're going to have to knock on some doors. I appreciate Brother Grandy. We were out knocking doors. My old lard was dragging me down. He's nice and spindly and skinny, and he was marching along there. And I said, uh, how much longer you want to stay out, preacher? I was getting tired. He said, well, I've got a goal to stay out certain, certain times. Said, okay, let's keep on going then. I was going to try to talk him out of it. I was weary and well doing it. I'm glad we didn't quit because it wasn't very much longer until we found that lady. You see, but he had him a goal to, to work toward that, to be working on it. And I'm, we're talking about new churches now. But, okay, so learn your area. Sometimes you'll be able to witness to folks right up front, right there in the home, right off the bat. Sometimes you'll need to set up an appointment and come back. Brother Labins and I did that one time. You remember that a couple of years ago, Brother Labins knocked on that lady's door, and I think you and Brother Silas went back and led her to Christ. And so that, that does work. But on the approach, so let's say that we're already in a soul winning situation. We've already, uh, we've already gotten into someone's home. We're sitting down. We're going to talk to them about the Lord, that sort of thing. And so uh, you just need to kind of chit-chat with them. And you may already know this, but I'll repeat it because it's something that I'm supposed to do right now. There's a very, <laughs> a very important thing that you need to learn, and, and, and you learn any kind of different. You can use the word F-O-R-M or whatever you want to, but I like the word help. H-E-L-P. This gives you some topics to talk about while you're in the home. Isn't it amazing how sometimes our brains just kind of take a hike on us? Mine does. My wife tells me about it all the time. <laughs> sometimes our brain just kind of kicks out neutral. I can't think. This has helped me to get out of trouble. H. There's some things you can talk about under the letter H. House. If they've just moved into a new house, they want to tell you about their new house. They want to talk to you about that house. Uh, you talk about their hobbies. You're walking up the driveway, and you see in the picture window there, 15 bowling trophies. I wonder what they like to do. <laughs> Be observant as you come to houses. Always be watching for, 
for, for the children's toys and things like that. If you have a bus ministry, you always direct your bus workers back to that address. Right. Keep notes on those things. Take notes while you're walking and keep up with what's going on. And so you got your house you can talk to them about, you the hobbies that you want to talk to them about. If they've got a, a big gun case over there and elk heads and deer heads and all that hanging all over the place, talk to them about hunting. If you don't know anything about hunting, be honest with them. Say, boy, I notice you've got a lot of game trophies and stuff. You must be a pretty big hunter. You know, I don't know much about hunting. Could you tell me something about it? Let them talk to you about it. If you do know something about hunting, then share some hunting stories with them. You're trying to build a relationship with someone you do not know. You're trying to find a common ground. That's all you're looking for, and that's what this little help outline may help you to do. If if uh, there's nothing that's really obvious that you can talk about under the age, house, hobbies, or you can talk about the humidity, the weather, heaven, heaven. <laughs> I'll cut it out. Hey, stay out of my preaching, would you? <laughs> or under E, employment. Where do you work at, Mr. Jones? Well, I work down at the blanky blank car dealership. You better drop that one in a hurry. He doesn't like where his job, where he's working at. Oh, man, I've got a marvelous job over here, such and such a firm. Really? What's your job like? What do you do over there? If you sense they don't like their job, don't talk about the job. If they do like their job, then you can chit-chat about the job. Again, the goal is just to build a bridge, to get to know them. Very, very good statement. If you can get a person to laugh with you, then they're just about ready to talk to about the Lord. I mean, if you can come to the place, then don't walk, you know, don't knock on the door and then start telling jokes. I'm not talking about that, but I mean, whenever they feel relaxed enough to begin to loosen up and laugh with you, then you know the barrier's coming down, that sort of thing. Then you've got your L loved ones. Talk to them about their children. If it's an elderly couple, they'll always have pictures of grandkids around. Ask them about their grandkids. Well, where are your children at now? You know, and, and literally, I've seen this happen. Be talking to an elderly couple. And, and, oh, I notice you have some pictures of the grandkids there. Yes, yes, and this is Susie, and this is tough. Well, where are they at? Well, they live all the way across the country. Boy, that's tough on you, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And you just, you just feel with them for a little while. Holy Spirit uses that. That shows you really care. It really does. And so you talk about your loved ones, and then P is present the plan of salvation. But there's three questions that you basically need to ask or that I ask whenever I begin to get ready to plant this, uh, to, to uh, talk about salvation. First one, where do you attend church? First question, where do you attend church? Well, uh, we don't go to church much. Thanks for being honest. I appreciate that. Or sometimes if, if, if things have warmed up pretty well, I'll say, hey, you're the person I've been looking for all day. And I'm telling you, 99 times out of 100, they'll chuckle at that. And every once in a while you have someone say, Oh, no, no, I'm not the person that you're looking for. But don't let that intimidate you. Just go on and be friendly with them and everything. But ask them, where do you go to church? Well, I don't go to church much. Well, thank you for being honest. And you really are the person I've been looking for all day long. Uh, you know, uh, by the way, if they tell you they do go to church, well, we go over here to such and such a church. That's fine. That's good. That's marvelous. Glad you go to church. Do you go regularly? That's the second question you want to ask. Do you go regularly? Because I've had folks tell me, oh, we, I'm a member at uh, Landmark Missionary Baptist Church. Marvelous. How often do you go? Yes, sir? Uh, a lot of times when we're talking to them, of course, now 99% of people I'm talking to are not Christians. Yeah. But uh, when I ask them, you know, what is your church? Mm -hmm. In other words, like, well, I've got some good friends that are Mormon. I've played softball with before. And, you know, they're a really good group of guys. Yeah. Or just something like that. So that, they know that I'm not going to come in there and, you know, bite their head off. And spit oh, yeah. Yeah, you never are unkind with anybody. Go to the Mormon church. What's the matter? You retarded or something? <laughs> you know, don't do that. <laughs> That's not how you win folks the Lord. Have you lost your mind? You, you, know, you know Brother Herb Hathaway, don't you? Now, that, that Brother Herb might do something like that. Matter of fact, I met a lady in Cal here in California one time. 
that Herb knocked on her door in Tempe, Arizona, whenever she lived there, and and uh, and that same type of scenario. She said, "Oh, I'm a born again Mormon." He said, "A born again Mormon? I ain't never heard of one of them." He said, "Let me show you why you can't be a born again Mormon boy." And he started rattling off verses at her. She said, "I got smart at him. I took all those references down, went and looked them up in my Bible, and said I found out he was right." <laughs> And she's in church, in a Baptist church down in Southern California right now. But that is not the standard thing to do. Believe me, all right? Just be kind and gracious. You're not out there to straighten anybody out. You're out there to win them. And if you would win some, you must be win some. Yeah. Do you listen to it? If you would win some, you must be win some. You must be friendly. A man that would have friends must show himself friendly. And so, that second question, do you attend regularly? Well, no, I don't go very often. Thank you for being honest. Always compliment folks for their honesty. Because in a little bit, I'm going to tell them, look, I want to be honest with you. And if they feel like they've been honest with me and that I've recognized that, then they'll assume that I'm about to be honest with them. Okay? Always be honest with them. So we're going to talk to him, and uh, and uh, so let's say that uh, that Mr. Harvey here, he said to me, he said, "Well, I, I go to church sometimes, but not very often." Well, Mr. Harvey, I appreciate you for being honest, and you know I've grown up in church most of my life. Now I'm going to give them just a brief testimony, brief testimony, part of testimony. Learned it so well about three years ago. Got visited on a, on a bus route, and some of you that I preached around before, what have you, may have heard me tell the story. Uh, tell the story. I visited on a bus route, and our children had asked uh, me to stop by in a trailer park behind the church where we were at and uh, visit a little boy. That